In the five years of the mandate CSR era, India has made significant process from adoption to application of the law and now to alignment to sustainable development goals. CSR interventions have attempted to tackle many development needs, brought about rigor in monitoring mechanisms and promoted adoption of new technologies, strategy and global standards in implementing development programs. As representatives of the country's largest IT consortium, NASCOM Foundation takes the lead in bringing together all stakeholders in the CSR and Tech for Good space for discussions on emerging themes in development, efficient practices, and scalable models for sustained impact. Before we begin, we would, I would quickly take two minutes to thank our conference partners, our platinum partner, ICICI Foundation, Gold Partners, JSW Foundation, and Future Skills, Broadcast Partners, DD India and DD News, Print Media Partner, Business India. In case you require any further assistance, in case you require any further assistance, please feel free to contact any of our NASCOM Foundation employee. We have two interpreters here, Kanchana and, uh, Kanchana, Kanchana and Atul. I thank Kanchan for now and we'll have Atul later. A few housekeeping announcements. Your exits are on the left in case we have an emergency. Accessible washrooms are on this floor in case you want to use. You can also follow us on Twitter handle at NASCOM Foundation and I would encourage you to keep, keep tweeting the event with the official hashtag NFCLC. I would now request you all to please put your phones uh, on silent so that we can have a very focused discussions going forward. Without further, ma ma without further ado, I would now like to kickstart our conference with our inaugural, uh, inaugural session, Catalyzing Change, and would like to invite our dignitaries to come on stage. I would like to first invite Arun Seid, Chairman, NASCOM Foundation, with a huge round of applause, please. Anuj Agarwal, Chief Operating Officer, ICICI Foundation. Mr. Keshav Murgesh, Chairman, NASCOM and CEO, WNS Global. And Dev Jani Ghosh, President, NASCOM. And I would now request Arun to please deliver the welcome, welcome address to the audience. Thank you very much and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, uh, conference uh, today. Uh, as uh, was just told to you, our uh, NASCOM CSR leadership conference has grown in stature. And this brings together uh, leaders and CSR experts, tech for good, grassroots NGOs, and public policy leaders to discuss trends, challenges, and the way forward in the CSR space, which is very, very important to us. And we, this conference is aiming to create learning opportunities for the ecosystem, our best new practices in CSR, and impact on technology. And one of the things that I've always observed is, uh, I'm going to ask a question of you guys. Which is the largest NGO, la largest NGO in India? Anybody would like to guess? Large means in terms of scale. That's not, I mean, it gives money out, but I'm saying in terms of operating NGOs. I mean, I would guess, you know, people like Akshay Patra and others are very large. I also on the board of HelpAge India, but our revenues are, I mean, or rather spends are maybe 120 crores, 200 crores. In terms of million dollars, there's not even uh, 30, uh, 50, 70 million dollars. So my, no, no, I'm making a different point. I'm saying this, Bangladesh has an NGO which does BRAC, does $500 million. I'm saying we are India with 1.3 billion people. So I'm just leaving it as a thought to you guys. How do we scale this issue for poverty, for development? So it's not about the numbers. It's what do we need to do to scale it? And I, I would pose that, you know, what NASCOM Foundation and all are doing is that we should certainly use technology to scale good rather than spending more money for the heck of it. I mean, my own example at HelpAge, we use Oracle. We have a, I mean, a lot of our board members initially said, Ki, why the hell are you spending so much money on Oracle? But at the end of it, we are now tripled our work without increasing the workforce. So we are doing much more using IT. So I mean, I would leave that as a thought to you guys. 
And it's been our mission to keep pace with giant strides the technology sector has been undertaking, and we would like to leave to the front. And you may find some of the demo zone exhibitions out here very interesting. We also try to practice what we preach. We are launching a new website today, uh, www.nascomfoundation.org today, and we'll show a website at, at this time a little later, which is second to none in terms of modern design to allow NGOs, participants to participate. We need to use these tools to be able to do stuff. Our programs are many, and uh, I'm sure uh, you know, you're going to run through the whole event uh, today to find out more about that. We are very big in skilling, and uh, Anuj, who's the CEO of our uh, Platinum Sponsor Partner, their focus on ICICI Foundation is all skilling. So NASCOM Foundation works a lot in skilling, in creating new age IT skills, employability, and youth from tier two and tier three villages. And we have a number of donors who help us in these programs. Our flagship program is the social innovation program and is moving into its 11th year of operation. And again, we've been at it thanks to donors like Emphasis and others out there. We collaborate uh, very much with MyGov, uh, which is volunteering. And to my mind, scaling is not just about money. The scaling is about using every company, using its employees, its volunteers. That's untapped resource, which is, not, ne which is never counted in the rupees crores. So how do we use volunteering and using technology to match the need of the volunteer with the need of the NGO out there? And I'm pretty sure whatever my gov is doing, whatever my kartavya at NASCOM we do, all these issue, I mean, efforts will help us to scale this particular thing. We continue to work with in the area of disability, channeling efforts, uh, and supporting livelihoods in this particular space. And that's a particular passion of our CEO, Ashok, who's here. And he, I'm sure he'll be talking to you people a lot more about this. And our digital literacy centers are spread across the country. And we continue to provide access to technology to the masses in this way. And last program is Big Tech, where uh, NASCOM's foundation is the largest software donor. Uh, we work with various companies to give, in, to give technology to NGOs to enable them to raise more money, do their operations more efficiently. This is all part of what NASCOM's foundation and DNA is, using technology to scale good. Our future focus, we aim to collaborate in CSR and the tech for good space from the front. Our aim is to bring together multiple stakeholders in this space and to create impactful partnerships. I must say that my IT industry is the leader in building and propagating tech in tech. And Dev Jani, who's our president, will talk a little more about what we do, and I don't think she needs any more introduction in this. But at NASCOM Foundation, our idea is to work with a majority, about 70%, with our own member companies, which are nearly 3,000, and be able to channelize their CSR money. Each of them are like, small amount, but how do we channelize into six, seven big programs so that as a nation we make a huge impact? And I believe that's where NASCOM Foundation is, and we don't only work with our IT companies, Anuj, for your information. We work a fair amount with others in banking, in retail, because the skills issue is common across. And as I said, NF plans to become the lodestone for focusing the efforts of all these, with these six or seven big things that we do. And our foundation's role is to continue to foster collaborative efforts in this industry. Uh, and we get great encouragement from the IT BPM industry uh, with its impact on the ground. And our philosophy is very simple. We will continue our efforts in, minimize, in mobilizing collective social responsibility by giving back to communities and maximizing the industry's resources and, exp and expertise. The agenda for the next six, the next uh, eight hours is going to be very interesting to you people. A number of eminent speakers are here who will discuss pertinent, pertinent issues about what are the areas to focus on development, how do we get there. More important is I don't think we need any more strategies. We just need more execution on the ground using technologies. Simple message that I would leave for this conference. And I'd like to thank our partners, especially ICI Foundation and others who've always helped us to uh, get where we are and have a great conference. Thank you.
I would now request Mr. Anuj Agarwal to come and address the audience, please. Can we have a huge round of applause for him, please? Mr. Keshav Murugesh, Chairman NASCOM, Ms. Devjani Ghosh, President NASCOM, Mr. Arun Seth, Chairman NASCOM Foundation, dignitaries, delegates, colleagues, and dear friends. A very good morning and a warm namaskar. It is my proud privilege to be standing amidst you in this prestigious CSR conference. I am sure there will be valuable interactions by subject matter experts during the course of this conference. Being in the field of skill development and working for inclusive growth, I will share my thoughts with you on catalyzing change through inclusive growth. <clears throat> with reforms in our country, during the last two decades, we are one of the fastest growing economies. The benefits have been coming. The number of poor in our country have been reducing. India has been able to move 133 million poor households out of poverty and double the middle class population from 300 million to 600 million. India's growth, however, is still very focused in urban areas and has a lot of regional imbalances. The growth has thus failed to translate into the well-being of large number of deprived and underprivileged. It is estimated that 80% of the poor population in our country lives in rural areas. A large proportion of households in rural areas depend on agriculture as their primary source of livelihood. Further, though India's GDP has grown over 6% on an average during the last few years, yet the growth in farm and its allied sectors is less than 2%. This probably explains the diversity between urban and rural areas and demonstrates the need for a distributed growth. The CSR resources can potentially bring about improvements in agri-economy and in rural areas. Many companies have rightly identified this as a focus area to catalyze change. As the urban sector is growing rapidly, the consumption story is also getting strengthened. The increasing population in the middle class is the new market for consumption. This aspiring middle class is a key consumer of products from the farm and allied sectors. Dairy products, poultry, processed food, etc. is seeing an increasing demand in our country. This creates an opportunity for the rural population, including those from the weaker sections, whether land-owning or landless. The poor households can enhance their livelihood, contribute to our country's growth story, and also in some ways enjoy the growth. Today's topic is important and very relevant. India enjoys a position that it is almost ready to leapfrog. Our growth has remained more or less stable, but we have the ability to accelerate. The demographic dividend of India has been much talked about. We need to remember that about three-fourths of our population is in rural areas, and many of them underprivileged and from poor economic background. If we really have to bolster economic growth, and take advantage of the demographic capital, the only way is to leverage on the ability from rural areas, including the poor and the underprivileged. We need to empower the villages. That can be the real engine for growth and bring about a transformation. Today, in search of a better life, more and more people are migrating to urban areas, despite an existing pressure already there in urban areas. If we have to see distributed growth, and for it to be sustainable, we need to create opportunities in rural areas and stop the migration to urban areas. The thinking has to be different from the conventional industrial or employment model. There could be various ways to foster economic growth through inclusive business. The following points, if addressed properly, could well trigger the desired results in a sustainable manner. The first pillar, skill development, and Mr. Seth talked about it. While multiple opportunities will show up, it is a reality that the rural population may not possess the skills in many of these traits. It thus becomes imperative that they acquire the skills which will help them in their livelihood and also assist the market 
to fulfill the demand. Various platforms, both from government as well as private institutions, are available to our citizens in rural areas who need to acquire or enhance their skills. Once acquired, these skills then lead to an improved livelihood. The key post the training is market linkage, else it could lead to situations that skill is available but does not connect to the market. Identifying the right skills based on market availability will lead to a win-win situation for both sides. Our experience shows that with quality skill development training, the average increase in livelihood is approximately Rs. 1500 per month per person, a significant amount in a rural setup. The second pillar, value chain. Staying on agriculture, a typical market activity for a farmer is to sell his produce to a broker, either as an individual seller or as a collective. While the collective approach would increase the negotiation ability of the farmer and hopefully get a better price, it does not necessarily ensure that there is an available market. Take for instance a situation where the previous year the onion crop had failed, had fetched good prices and as a result most farmers in the region decided to cultivate onions in the current year, leading to a glut which could result in not only the price crashing but there being such oversupply that there is no market for onions even at throwaway prices. This is a familiar story to anyone who has been tracking the Indian economy for the last decade or so. Thus, the sustainability of a farm enterprise comes into question. The possible solution is for the farmer to become an element of a value chain. Most businesses, by nature, seek stability to ensure their own stability, uh, sustainability and hence work to maintain a value chain that does not throw any surprises but works like a well-oiled machine. Each element of the value chain gets an economic reward which is commensurate with the value addition that they provided. The value chain addresses a big problem for the farmers, that is perishability of the product and helps create alternate products which last longer, thus creating sustainability. The third pillar, technology-backed information systems and financial solutions. India is the IT leader giving multiple solutions globally. Our own country should be able to reap the benefits of this strength. Technological solutions in areas of accurate weather forecasting, soil health analysis, suggest the produce based on topography and soil, price movement tracking and market, creation of local e-marketplace can be a force multiplier for capability building and inclusive business. One of the things which hampers business is hurdles in the easy flow of money. With the increasing penetration of mobile telephony in our country, including rural areas, it has a big potential for e-payments and villagers are already using it for smaller transactions. If the entire supply chain adopts this technology, it will lead to enhanced efficiency and will give growth a fillip. Any steps or initiatives in the direction of improving digital payments will give long-term gains for the market players as well as our country. Let me give a couple of examples to illustrate what I have spoken so far. The first one is about a village, Machi Gundahali, near Chikmagalur in Karnataka. This coffee and pepper growing area has 807 households out of which 506 are landless families. The landless work as laborers earning about 250 rupees a day, that too only for 180 days in a year depending on seasonal activity. During the village empowerment program, based on analysis and discussion with experts, it was identified that mushroom could be a good product for this region and it does not need much space for cultivation. 67 villagers received training in mushroom cultivation and within six months, 60% of them had started growing oyster mushrooms. This gives a potential of earning approximately 5,000 rupees per month for every family around the year. And since it's a vitamin and protein rich food, also improves nutrition in their own food by self-consumption. Today, in less than 12 months, this village is known as Mushroom Village and sells approximately 30 kgs per day. They soon realized and have now got into value chain to beat perishability. The villagers are also selling dried mushrooms across the state for exports. With the permission of Chair, I would like to show an AV after I have completed. The other example is about a weed called Lantana. This is a plant which has later please, which has small flowers in different colors. 
and is often used as a hedge. However, this plant does not allow any vegetation to grow near it. Hence, it is killing the grasslands in forest areas, causing acute shortage of food for animals like deer. This weed multiplies and the need of the hour is to remove so that the grasslands can grow for fodder to animals and maintain ecological balance. This threw up an opportunity for villagers, which eventually led to their economic gain. The villagers in Uttarakhand and Tamil Nadu received skill training to make products, including furniture, from lantana stem, which sells easily in the market because it offers good strength. So, while a problem for the forest and ecology was being solved, it created value for the villagers in a sustainable manner. Research shows that this option can now be taken to the next level for product development. A very recent experience was when I checked out of a hotel in Uttar Pradesh. After I made the payment, the executive politely told me that there is a memento for me from the hotel. She put across a necklace to me which had very large beads in multicolor, a product any foreigner will love. Looking at the confusion on my face, she told me that the beads are made of clay from the banks of Holy River Ganges at Varanasi. A very simple item, <clears throat> but tremendous value for the receiver and in the process creating value in the supply chain. For all this to be sustainable, <clears throat> creating rural enterprises is most important. The rural population is quick to grab the opportunity and if right environment is created, many such rural enterprises will come up which will help multiply the gains across the chain. These rural enterprises should work on local products and its production which shall not only provide uniqueness but also the competitive advantage on cost. Another benefit of these rural enterprises will be depending on scale, they shall employ local youth leading to employment generation and enhanced disposable income. This will create a cyclic multiplier for economic and sustainable growth. There are multiple examples on rural enterprises like beauty parlors, mobile repair shops, electric repair shops, organic produce, herbal medicines, products, etc. And each of them are case studies in themselves. I was in West Sikkim last month. It was heartening to see that a remote village, Talkharkha, with a small population, is taking steps to attract tourists. The villagers have created decent homestay facilities and local youth have been training for being guides for bird watching trails. The opportunities are there in the market, but we also see inertia. There is always the fear. There are the skeptics. However, to foster growth, the opportunity is to be grabbed. We should not wait further. It is a competitive world. If we don't grab this opportunity of improving our economic growth through inclusive business, some other country will take advantage. And Mr. Seth just referred to an NGO from Bangladesh, how active they are in the market. We need to take the right steps and progress. Dear friends, as many of you are active leaders in the CSR space, I would urge you to focus on this book, big potential for creating impact which exists today. Your CSR programs can be designed in this direction. Create solutions to harness these opportunities and contribute for a distributed growth. A bit of channelization can foster the economic growth through inclusive business and will stay for a long time because it is sustainable. Your intervention, inspiration and some local innovation can indeed catalyze a big change. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It has been my pleasure to speak to all of you and share my thoughts on the subject. We are a vast country and the resources will never be enough. Yet, I am confident that the coming days will see a lot of economic activity triggered by inclusive business, which will lead to a much balanced and distributed growth. Enjoy this wonderful conference and make the best of it. I would also be happy to discuss about the activities of ICSA Foundation during the break. Thank you. May I now request for the AV to be played. मैं विनोद राज मैं इस चुनौती से लड़ने के लिए तैयार था मेरी आंखों में रोशनी भले ही अधूरी थी पर खेलों में कुछ कर दिखाने की हिम्मत नहीं थी बचपन से ही एक ही सपना था अपने जिले अपने देश के लिए नाम कमाऊ 
और अपने आपा और अम्मा के सर से जिम्मेदारियों का बोझ कम कर दू पर मेरी जीत की चमक मेरी आंखों को ही चुभ गई मेरी आंखों की रोशनी पूरी तरह से चली गई आलत और खराब हो गए और चलो अब्बा चल बसे ऐसा लगा जैसे अम्मा के कंधों का सबसे बड़ा बुझ अब मैं को दू पर अम्मा ने कभी उम्मीद नहीं छोड़ी और ना ही मेरा फिर एक दिन उन्हीं उम्मीदों में रोशनी की किरण नजर आई जब ऐसे ऐसे फाउंडेशन का एक ट्रेनर ने मुझे और मेरी अम्मा को मशरूम कल्टीवेशन कोर्स के बारे में बताया ये कुछ बिल्कुल फ्री था कहने को बस पंद्रह दिनों की ट्रेनिंग थी पर पंद्रह दिनों ने हमारी जिंदगी के सारे दिन बदल दिए हमने अपने ही आंगन में मशरूम उगाना शुरू किया इतना ही नहीं शुरू में तो हमने आधे से ज्यादा मशरूम गांव वालों को फ्री में ही बांट दिया ताकि इस काम के लिए दूसरों को भी मोटिवेशन कर सके पहली बार ऐसा सुबह कुछ नहीं की आंखों से भी दिखाई देती है आईसीआई से कोर्स बुक किए हुए बस दस महीने हुए और हम महीने का करीब सौ किलो से ज्यादा मशरूम उगा लेते हैं सुपरमार्केट से लेके बड़े बड़े संस्थाओं तक तो हमारे मशरूम सप्लाई होते हैं ऐसे ऐसे एकेडमी में भी इस कोर्स का ट्रेनिंग देने जाता हूं जो विनोद राज कभी कच्चे मकान में रहता था आज अपना पक्का घर बना रहे बस एक स्पोर्ट्स एकेडमी खोलना चाहता हूँ ताकि जिस जिंदगी को जीने का सपना मेरे बचपन में कभी देखा था वो जिंदगी दूसरे बच्चे जी सके आंखों ने रोशनी छोड़ी सपना देखना नहीं थैंक यू ऐसे ऐसे थैंक लाखों लोग आज अपने पैरों पे खड़े होकर मुस्कुरा रहे हैं हम चाहते हैं ये संख्या बढ़ती जाए ये हुनर की दुआ सबको लगती जाए Thank you very much, Mr. Anuj, for your great words and the wonderful video. I would now like to invite Mr. Keshav Murugesh to come and address the audience, please. Can we have a huge round of applause for him? Well, good morning, everyone, and it's wonderful to see so many people in this audience. You're obviously a very important part of uh, all the initiatives we run, the companies we run. Mm -hmm. and it's wonderful to see that this hall is already completely filled up you know many years ago the first president of nascom when he was asked what nascom stood for he said roti kapda makan or bandwidth you know as i look around the room it's reduced quite a bit but i see that a lot of people are still leveraging bandwidth quite a bit but it's wonderful to see that so many of you are also involved through your companies in terms of the first three roti kapda or makan and this morning when i spent an hour with the most dynamic and passionate current president of nascom debjani ghosh 45 minutes were only spent in terms of her passion for how the industry could really impact the world at large through social good it clearly shows that this industry is now led by the right leadership and nascom is led led by the right president who is making sure that not only is the business of it progressing well but all initiatives are being driven around making sure that we are impacting the good in india so without you know further ado you know what can businesses do with 150 million dollars just think about it you know all of us run large companies but you could go out buy a large company and be more impactful in the marketplace you could go out and create 
completely new strategic initiatives around technology. You can go and create hundreds of centers of innovation and impact, you know, your business, your profitability, and, you know, some of those metrics. But guess what our industry did, the IT BPM industry? Many of you in the audience here are part of that industry. What did we, did, we do? We actually did something that was far more critical to business. We went out and made an impact in the communities around us. And just think about it. Somebody said at one time that businesses cannot succeed if the society around them fails. Just think about it. It's a very important point. Businesses cannot succeed if the society around, you know, fails. And although the Indian IT BPM industry is much smaller by comparison to many other industries uh, in this country, do you know that we are the third biggest spender in terms of corporate social responsibility initiatives? Right? It's a, it's a very unique kind of uh, uh, impact, I would say. And for a business that impacts great people, impacts or leverages 4.4 million people, obviously you would expect that this industry would be quite active in terms of the community from which they draw these resources and also, you know, focuses on reskilling them, working to make them better, more competitive, smarter. And through some of these initiatives driven by these companies, giving back to society in terms of just making that skill base more relevant and then impacting the rest of the country. Out here, I must specifically call out the role of NASCOM Foundation, again, led by such a dynamic uh, team. And again, I must call out Ashok, uh, the CEO of this institution who has brought in a breath of fresh air into NASCOM Foundation. The foundation is completely focused on leveraging all the impact that can be created from NASCOM companies and then giving that back to society as good initiatives. Here, I must mention uh, Self for Society as a very unique initiative where the government tied up with a particular part of industry in order to give back good to society. The very fact that the IT industry was chosen to be such an important part of Self for Society showcases how important the IT industry is in the minds of the government and also the fact that the government realizes and believes that the people working in this industry and the companies involved in this in industry can really be very, very relevant from a country point of view. While we are talking about this, I think all of us, you know, in our personal capacities as well as working through our institutions are all the time looking for ways and means to give back. That's what we should be doing, frankly. Right? We should all the time be looking for ways and means to be giving back to society. But I just want to call out a few examples of some great companies. You just saw the wonderful video from ICICI Bank. But a few other examples of how uh, we are actually giving back to society. First and foremost, more than 15 lakh people, 1.5 million people, have now been trained through digital literacy models in this country you know, by companies belonging to the sector. Uh, I must point out that companies like Cisco and Intel have set up school and college level programs that actually prepare next generation talent for some of the new disruptive models like emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, 3D printing, things like that. Microsoft, SAP, IBM, eClerks, Scient, and Symantec are actually impacting employability of people uh, by actually focusing on underprivileged youth and training them in technical and soft skills. Similarly, there are companies like other companies like Cisco, Dell, and Mindtree that are also running end-to-end -end impact models that are impacting healthcare, impacting you know, virtual classrooms, and also 
helping with creating technologies for the disabled. Uh, other companies from a business process point of view also are doing something, things very interesting around cyber security and uh, many other you know, kind of initiatives. And it, it's so n nice to see that every company today is now leading this initiative. And in, for me, when I interact with CEOs of companies, I realize that the soul of those companies really are the CSR initiatives of those companies. So I must congratulate all of you for being such an important part of the soul of each of your companies. So where do we go from here? I think that's the key you know, question that I would like to leave behind. I actually believe that the power of technology can be leveraged significantly from here in order to impact corporate social responsibility in an even more impactful manner long term. And I believe that technologies such as uh, AI, blockchain, and the IoT can be leveraged well. Now, while traditionally we would think that these technologies can be leveraged more from a skilling or a reskilling point of view, the reality is they also can be used in different ways provided we run very focused initiatives around them. So first and foremost, I think that for any such initiative takeoff, uh, tech-based monitoring frameworks can be set up inclu to include all NGO partners that are participating in some of these programs. Uh, this will give good access to last mile you know, beneficiaries. NGO partners can keep feeding in real-time data and therefore information supply can be much more impactful. We all know that in the execution of projects, there are many hurdles, and that could be because of the number of beneficiaries, too many stakeholders, lots of communities involved, and multiple tiers of implementation. And probably here, blockchain can be a technology that can be used to solve you know, the problems and make sure that information is available for various stakeholders to get in and really leverage that information to be part of the value chain. Impact analysis to me is often a challenge and the ability to actually now use uh, you know, data and, uh, and really leverage big data to go after solutions that can give you incisive knowledge of how projects are actually impacting or how projects are actually being leveraged is something that we can really focus on. And as an industry, we constantly talk about things like crowdsourcing, we talk, we talk about collaboration and, and, and inno innovation. Here, I would like to really encourage you know, all companies to try and come together and run one big program which is common across all companies. Because I'll tell you, if you listen carefully, if you had listened carefully to what the two speakers before me said, and for all of those who are co continuously monitoring this area, you will appreciate that there is a lot of money actually going into this area. Some of it is not being coordinated in order to give the best impact. And therefore, if we can all come together through institutionals, institutions like NASCOM Foundation to say that together, while each company may run different initiatives, in one area, we should come together and drive one big initiative that NASCOM Foundation can then present as contribution of the industry to the nation, I think it can have amazing impact. Uh, I, I must leave the stage now, just leaving with you the wonderful words of you know, Anne Frank, the Holocaust survivor, and she said, how wonderful is it that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. So with that, I would request all of you to enjoy this conference. I would you know, request all of you to make new friendships, new affiliations. Each of you belong to a particular company, but together you can actually transform this country and the world. You know, exchange cards, get to know each other well, look for more and more ways of interacting and you know, collaborating, and you know, let's make this world a better place. Before I leave, one last saying, but it's from Victor Hugo. And he said, for the bold, the future is only opportunity. So just go out there and be bold. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Keshav, for those wonderful words. I would now like to invite uh, Tepjani ma'am to come and address the audience, please. Can we have the huge round, round of applause, please? Thank you and good morning everyone. So let me start with a quick question. Something happened in 1969 that pretty much changed the world that we knew it forever. Any guesses what? Apollo mission. Huh? Apollo mission. Any other guesses? First man on the moon. That was pretty revolutionary, but there was something else that happened. Something that you cannot live, you, I cannot live without today. What is it that you cannot live without today? <laughs> Mobile phones, <laughs> internet. We are celebrating, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years of the internet. 1969 is when the first data packet was successfully transferred between one node to another, thus creating the foundation of what we know as the World Wide Web. It's a, it's a game-changing year. The inter internet revolution for the last 50 years has been bigger and more life-impacting than any other revolution we have had. I mean, just imagine how far woman and man has, has reached and the kind of impact that we have made thanks to that one thing, thanks to the internet. But you know what's most exciting? I mean, I loved Keshav's last quote um, about what Hugo had said, that for the bold, the future is only about opportunities. Because the future is way more exciting than the past. The f our possibilities, what we can do going forward, is, is even more powerful than what we've been able to achieve in the last 50 years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. I mean, today you have these three things coming together. Computing power. You have the com computing power of the world's biggest supercomputers today in your mobile phones. The way technology is advancing, uh, the computing power available to us at our fingertips is just mind-blowing. We've never had that before. Second, proliferation of mobile phones. Everyone has a mobile phone today. You go down to villages, they have mobile phones. In fact, we were working on an agri-tech project with farmers, and they, they clearly told us, you don't have to teach us how to use mobile phones. Everyone knows that. It's a, it's a basic human right today, right? Everybody has it. Everybody knows it. And then the third is the emergence of the cloud, a secure cloud. It's becoming a reality. And these three coming together can create or give us the power to solve problems that we have never been able to solve. But there's a secret sauce missing. Even when you pull these three two things together, there is something that's missing. There's something that's needed to create the magic. Any guesses what that is? What's that fourth ingredient that's missing? You've computing power, you've cloud, you've mobile. What's the fourth thing that's needed to make that magic a reality? Thank you. People. And I think that's the point to ponder today, and that's the point that we really have to get today. You know, they say that artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, or rather the AI revolution, is going to be way more powerful than even the internet revolution. But I think we are at that point in road where the road is going to break off into two, and we have to choose one path. One path where AI stands for artificial intelligence. The other path where AI stands for augmented intelligence. What's the difference? It's both AI. What's the, they're both machine learning. But there's a big difference between artificial intelligence and augmented intelligence. Artificial intelligence is about the machine. Augmented intelligence is about the machine working for the human. It's about the machine ensuring that the human, rather than replacing the human, it's about making the human more productive. It's about the, making the human more effective. And who decides? Who decides whether we go left or we go right? Whether we make it all about the machines or we make it about the man and or human and machine? It's us. We are the ones, companies, countries, people, we are the ones who will decide which way do we want to go. What do we want our future to be? Do we want our future to be about 
in artificial intelligence created by machines to do everything better than humans or do we want a future where the machines will work hand in hand with the humans to improve human productivity and human effectivity now being an eternal optimist i am hopeful that we will choose the latter path and we will make our future about human and machines or human intelligence augmented by machines and that today is really the key differentiator you know the business model the the competition model of business is completely changing it's no more how much technology one company has versus other everybody has technology technology is the great equalizer today everybody has access to the same technology what makes the difference are the people what kind of people what are you able to do with the technology what are your people people able to do with the technology and i strongly believe that the future leaders will be determined by their ability to do good the companies the countries that really leverage technology to solve some of the biggest problems facing humankind are the ones that will be known as our future leaders and this is where i think the role of csr is going through a fundamental change today csr is not the thing that good businesses do it is becoming the thing that shapes good businesses and it's a fundamental difference it's becoming that thing which is today the most important topic for most of the good ceos and successful ceos that even i personally know I mean every time I talk to one of the leaders whether it's Keshav Rishad any of these leaders of India today they will spend more time talking about social impact and what they can do now why is that it is because today that is what differentiates companies if i have to join a company i will look at what does that company stand for today especially the millennial workforce they join companies based on what that company stands for what that company represents what does that leader stand for you know does he have a social conscience does she have a social conscience and i think this is becoming more and more important so my key message is we have to stop i think as an industry as a community stop treating csr as a thing we do after the fact CSR is an integral part of building successful businesses being successful leaders of frankly professional development it's a way for companies to unleash that passion that every single employee has and put it to some good use which builds loyalty which builds that feeling of i can make a difference and every a single one of our employees can make a difference I lend with a beautiful example from NASCOM a NASCOM employee one of our employees in Chennai was recently affected by cyclone gaja pretty pretty badly his entire family home both parents both side of parents his wife's parents and his own parents were completely destroyed he came and asked for a few days leave to say i want to see what i can do to help take as much time as you want could sense that in him could sense that passion could sense that 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 determination that i am going to do something so take take the time off take not just take the time off but tell us how we can help for for nearly 3 weeks he was on the road every single day moving from one affected area to another organizing working with the industry working with local communities to organize meals to organize clothes to organize uh, stationery for the kids who couldn't go to school because their their school buildings had been destroyed and he touched the lives of thousands of people just this one person and i think that's what we have to realize somewhere in us is that power to change the world is that power to really make a difference and employees today are looking for that company that will give them that platform that will give them the ability to actually go and unleash that power so i think csr is reaching a stage where it's fundamental for a company because the only way you build good good companies is with good people and csr is becoming that way more important than anything else where you can attract the best talent so as we work through the conference i would strongly encourage us to think about some of these things how do we get 
CSR to the CEO agenda because if it isn't, the company is in problem. The leadership is in problem. How do we enable that? So with that, thank you very much for taking the time to be here today. And I really do hope you have an excellent conversation and you have an excellent conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devjani, ma'am. I would now request uh, Ashok to come on stage and pro uh, present a token of appreciation to our all dignitaries. Uh, we would start with Mr. Arun Seth. Can we have a round of applause, please, for Mr. Anuj Agarwal? Mr. Keshav Murgesh. And finally, Devjani, ma'am.